What's up, COD gaming lover? Falcon. a bike.
doing? Joe, um, if you want to learn how to play acoustic guitar, I would pick up the cheapest one you can find. You don't need to get a nice one when you start playing. And then um, learn how to play some basic chords. Like um, there's some of them that are very easy for your hands, like uh, like a C. And then just learn how to like strum a C, and then maybe learn how to strum a, like a D. Learn how to strum an E minor. And then just like learn, I don't know, three or four chords. Just ones that are easy for your hands, and then just strum those chords that you know. See if you find something that you think sounds nice. And that's where I'd start. Buy the cheapest guitar you can find. We're happy you're here too, virtual assistant. Yeah, do it, pick it up. Oh yeah, good point. Some guitars, it's like, it works your hand a little bit to just press the strings down. They have some resistance. Um, yeah, you'll build some hand strength, too. You play guitar, too, virtual assistant? What kind of music are you into? Finger picking? Nice! I love finger picking. Like, uh, like folksy stuff or, uh... See, I like folksy, relaxing, finger-picking stuff, um, but I also like death metal. Some of you might be surprised to hear that. I love distorted, chunky guitar riffs that come from the depths of the pit. It is time for you to get a guitar. Favorite metal bands, it, this is going to sound terrible, okay, because the names of these bands are just disgusting. Um, Cannibal Corpse, I enjoy. I enjoy Suffocation. Um, 
dying fetus, as terrible as that name sounds. <laughs> like it. Have I ever heard of Mayhem? I don't know. Your metal taste is a little more tame. I mean, I started, that's how it starts. I started tame. Like tame, as in like Metallica, Pantera. I still, I mean, I still love those guys. Um, Pantera. Whew. They have some stuff that really hits. It's like this groovy heavy metal with a good beat. And I like, uh, you know, even new metal, like uh, more mainstream, like Korn. Um, Slipknot's heavier, but they have some really, uh, some stuff that you can really listen to. You guys know what that is, right? The Br Ventura Highway, there it is, Jonathan Bassett! The Brook and the Bluff. I'm gonna write that down. You better not disappoint me. Wrote it down. You guys doing all right today? The homework didn't treat you too bad, right? Good homework, says Chris. All right, we're gonna transition out of guitar mode into digital controls mode. You skipped lunch because of homework focus yesterday. 
Not bad. Can you play Take Me Home by John Denver? I haven't played that one. Take me home, country roads. Um, we should look that up after lecture, though. Yes, we should. Man, it's always a transition getting out of guitar mode and then focusing the mind on math. Jeez. It's good, though, to break it up, do different things. All right. Let's get into it. First, we'll start with a little bit of recap. And um, what we were doing last time is we were tracking a reference using something called feed forward control. I don't know if I called it feed forward control yesterday, but that is certainly what it is. And this is the definition of the control signal you use for a feed forward. I don't know if you can hear that, but I think somebody's mowing the lawn right outside. It's a reminder that life is going on outside of the confines of our home. Okay, so you have a feedback gain matrix. And then it's times the difference between your reference states and your estimated state vector. And then we add this feed forward term. So I'll call this the feed forward term. Seriously, like right outside my window. Okay. So these are what we call our reference states. So our controller is trying to minimize the difference between our estimated states and what we call our reference states. I know, focus! I'll, I'll focus. I'll focus. So the, the estimated or the reference states are related to your reference input by this equation. And our like our, our feed forward term. So this is what our steady state control input needs to be to get us to the reference, it's NU times R. And the way you solve for NX and NU, let's just rewrite that, that equation. We derived this last time. A minus the identity matrix, B, C, zero, you take the inverse of this, and multiply it by a vector that has a zero vector at the top and then a one at the bottom. So you can solve for NX and NU if you have, you know, A, B, C. So in other words, your state space model. So we've been working with controlling this spring mass system and we're tasked with the goal oops of moving this mass 
to uh, a certain reference position, which we'll call R. So we're scooting it over, and the way we move it is we apply a control force U. And we, I have these A, B, C, D matrices for this system if we define our states to be um, position and velocity. So this one is a state-based system with uh, using physical coordinates. So given A, B, C, D, you can solve for N, X, and N, U. And then once you have N, X, and N, U, you can... Um, figure out your reference states, you can figure out this steady state term, and you plug it into your control signal. And anyways, this will drive your system to where we want it to be. And then the last piece, because we never have access to the true states, we have to estimate the states. And we have a little updated estimator equation. So this is the this is the last little piece. Our state estimate is going to be a minus bk minus lc times your previous state estimate. So we're going to go down another line plus bk times your reference states, but our reference states are nx times r. And then we have plus B times our steady state input, and that's going to be NU times R. And then finally, we have plus L times our output measurement from the prior step. Okay. So with this definition of your control signal, with this definition of an estimator, you can take a, a system like this, spring mass system, whatever, use state feedback control and um, follow at least a step reference signal. However, this is not the preferred method for doing a tracking problem using state feedback. The preferred method is to use an integrator. Um, the, the reason is, well, okay, I say versatile because with an integrator, you're gonna be able to track all sorts of reference inputs. That's what I mean by versatile. Not just a step, but you could do a ramp, you could do a sinusoid, you could do some random funky thing. Uh, an integrator is also more robust. What I mean by this is, and you guys have experienced this, when you design a control system for something in real life, your model is um, usually not super accurate. Like it, it's not perfect. So you're going to have modeling errors and you need a controller that can deal with modeling errors. An integrator, an integrator can do that. Um, yeah, and I think for these two reasons, it's just much more popular. So if you go out into industry, you're designing controllers, it's good to know how to use this. Will this give steady state error if your estimator isn't good? Um, an integrator can even overcome... When you, when you say your estimator isn't good, I'm assuming like your estimator model, because your estimator is based on your underlying model. And if your model's bad, then your estimator won't be the best. Um, but an integrator covers many sins, even modeling errors. That's what part, part of what makes it so robust. So, oh, you're referring to the feed forward. Um, that's a good point. This feed forward method, if you just define your controller to be like this, um, modeling errors are going to make this in U term be bad. Uh, well, it won't be perfect. And because this term needs to be perfect in order to have zero steady state error. So, um, 
unless your model's perfect, which it'll never be, you're going to get some steady state error with this feed forward approach. Okay, so we're going to use an integrator, but first I want to translate what this means into language that we used earlier in the class. Um, and what I want to talk about is system types. Because we've talked about um, system types, and it turns out that the system type is related to integrators. So question for the chat. Um, what does a type one system mean? I mean, there's different ways to describe this. But just throw it out there. What is a type one system? Okay, I see one open loop pull. Open loop pull at Z equals one. Okay, good. Uh, zero steady state error for uh, a step reference. Um, perfect. It turns out a type one system So I'm connecting this to integrator language. A type one system has one integrator. So adding an integrator to your system, to a control system is synonymous to adding an open loop pole at Z equals one. So, um, To add an integrator, we need to add an open loop pull at z equals positive one. But uh, the question you might be asking is, what are the open loop poles of a state space system? I'll also open this to the chat because you may know, you may already know. Continuous integrators are one over S, discrete integrators are one over Z minus one. Yes, Tim, except I think it might be Z over Z minus one. Uh, how may I apply this to Twitch integration in real life? Integrating Twitch into your real life? You don't want to do that. Tim, I think uh, I think you're very close. I'm just, I'm not totally certain. But it definitely has a Z over Z minus one. I'm not sure if it's a Z in the numerator as well. Um, the open loop poles of a state space system are, so answer, eigenvalues of the A matrix. So if you have a state space model and you want to see if it's type one, in other words, if it has an integrator already, you take the eigenvalues Will it always be a type one system? Probably not though. Yeah, I mean, like we can check, like let's look at this A matrix that we have. We'll go into MATLAB. Actually, I think I already prepared a little, yeah. These are the A, B, C, D matrices. The homework seven we had was type one, right? I don't. I didn't check the open loop poles. I don't think it was. Maybe, maybe it could be. Okay, but this is our A matrix. Let's run this and then get the eigenvalues of A. 
So this is our spring mass system. So this isn't type one, right? It doesn't have an integrator. These are not equal to one. So we have to add an integrator. Integrating AI into Twitch does use a loop to pull Twitch for stream chat. You're speaking in riddles. You confuse me. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to add one more state to our model. And this state is the integral of the output error. So what's the output error? Well, we know what that is. It's the difference, we've called it EK in the past, but it's the difference between your reference signal and your measured output. So we're going to add one state to our model. So this, this model we're working with, it has two states. We're going to make it third order by adding, you don't have to apologize. Um, we are adding one state. Let's talk about how to get the integral of the output error. That's going to be on the next page. I'll give you like another second or two to catch up if you're writing this, which you should be having some kinesthetic activity, such as writing down what you're listening to, what you're watching. It helps embed this stuff in your mind better. You should probably be sniffing. That, that could sound bad, but you should maximize sensory things. You could be uh, smelling a candle. I don't know, maybe that's too extreme. Is drinking coffee considered kinesthetic? Yes. Okay. So, integral of the output error, Abhijit, yes. This third state, if you're going to add an integrator, this third state is going to be the integral of the output error. So, not the output error itself. Let's talk about how you get the integral, guys. We know that from a graph, the integral is the area under the curve. So let's say, so we have K on this axis. We're updating our error like every step. If we do a zero order hold between each of these, because we're not getting any information in between the steps. Until I get another update on the error, the best information I have is that the error has you know, remain the same. Well, there's other approximations you could do, but this is common. So, if I'm getting the area under this, a Riemann sum is really good, or like the rectangle rule. So, here we go. Um, let's take the integral from zero up to step k of the output error. So we're going to get the area all the way, and then there's steps in between, but we're going to get it all the way up to k, right? And what, what I'm going to end up doing here is deriving a difference equation for the error. You'll see how that comes about. Do you agree with this equation. The error up to step k is the error up to k minus 1. So let's say, uh, 
like if I were to highlight all this, but this time only go up to k minus 1, the error all the way to k would be the error, I mean the, the integral up to k minus 1, but then I'd have to add the area of um, this little piece to make it equal, you know, to the next thing. So that would be um, k minus 1 to k. But what I'm going to use to approximate this last one is the rectangle rule, also known as the left Riemann sum. So it's going to be the height of the rectangle, which the height here is the error at k minus 1. And then the, um, in terms of k, the width of this is just um, k minus k minus 1. And it's just 1. Like the distance between each of these is one step. So the width is, in terms of steps, it's 1. So this is that rectangle, the rectangular area. <laughs> oh, der. <laughs> okay. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to define a state, which is the integral of the error. So we're going to call it like x sub i. This is the way the Franklin textbook defines it. So we're going to say by definition, or wait, let's put a k here xi k is by definition the integral of the output error up to step k. And that would mean that if we use this definition for k minus 1, it would just be um, the integral up to k minus 1. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this equation up above, but just use these state definitions. So this ek, xik, and this is how I'm getting a difference equation, is equal to that integral at the previous step, but now I need to add... Um, you know, this little rectangular piece to finish up the integral. So that's ek minus 1. And like we wrote earlier, I know that that is my reference minus my measurement. That's just the definition of the output error. But I know that y is related to my other states by c. So my output matrix times the states. So we're assuming that the D matrix is zero here. So I'm going to make those substitutions. So it's going to be XI K minus one plus RK minus C XK. Wouldn't it be RK minus one minus YK minus one? Yes. Thanks for bringing that up. This should be k minus 1. If I'm doing e k minus 1, it should be k minus 1. You're absolutely right. k minus 1 minus c x k minus 1. Oops. And this is not a vector. I don't need a line underneath there. I'm going to put a box around this. So we have successfully made a difference equation that says, okay, 
if I know the integral of the error up to the k minus 1 step, if I know the reference at k minus 1 and the states at k minus 1, I can predict what the that integral of the output error would be at the next step. Okay. So we have a difference equation for the integral of the output error. And we're going to add this to our state space model to create what we call an augmented state space model. So this is how we're going to augment it. We're going to we're going to take our original state space model which has states x k and then so you in this example we have two states and then at the bottom, we're going to tack on our third state, which we know is the integral of the output error. So let's fill in what we know about um, our original model first. Okay. X, K minus 1. Put that there. Let's do this first. Okay, so x, k, we know it's equal to a times x, k minus 1 plus b times u, k minus 1. All right. But now we're augmenting this so that wherever we have our states, you know, we're, we're tacking on this third state in this case. So our original states, xk is going to be a times x plus zero times the integral states because my original state equation doesn't depend on the integral. It doesn't show up anywhere. Now let's do the same thing. But now we're going to do the equation for the integral, right? So xi of k, so I'm just using this equation up here. It's going to be minus c times my original states. So that's from this last piece over here. Plus 1 times the previous integral plus 0 times u. But then I have an extra thing that I have to consider now because the integral depends on the, the reference. So it's uh, plus 1 times the reference. And... My original states don't depend on the reference, so I'm going to put a zero vector there because it'll make the dimensions work out. So this is what it looks like symbolically, but to help this make a little more sense, we're going to fill this in with the information from the example we've been doing. So let's do that. We know that our first state... I'm just going to call it position of k, velocity of k, and then we'll add on our third state, the integral of the error. So we're going to fill this all in to help it make a little more sense. I'm going to pull up the original A matrix. So it's 0 0.9922. So this is the A matrix from the previous page. 0 0.0124 minus 0 0.1277 0 So here in the top left, we have A. And then to the right of that, oh, this should actually be a zero 
vector. To the right of this, I'm going to put 0, 0. So this is our 0 vector. Underneath this, I have to put the minus of my C matrix. My C matrix is 1, 0. So this is going to be minus 1, 0. And then the last element of this is just a one. Okay. And then moving on, our B matrix was 0 0.0001, 0 0.0124, and then we have a zero underneath that. Oh, I didn't put my states here. That matrix multiplies position at k minus 1, velocity k minus 1, that output error integral at k minus 1. This B matrix multiplies u at k minus 1. So this is our B matrix. So this makes more sense now, right? Okay. 0, 0, 1, R, K minus 1. All right, next is the cool part. Because remember, the whole goal of adding the integral state was to make this a type 1 system. In other words, we should have an open loop pole at z equals 1 now. I thought I was going crazy, but the background music is still on. <laughs> That's true. I'll turn it up just a little bit. Unless it bothers you, let me know. No, it's not you. There is some very mild background music. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build this augmented A matrix in MATLAB. So I'm going to do A, and then right next to the A was a 2 by 1 zeros vector. Underneath it was minus C, and then a 1. So let's evaluate this. Looks right. And then, take the eigenvalues of it, and what do you see? It's beautiful. We now have our original open loop poles, and we added one at one. Yes. Somehow it works. The mystery is a little bit beyond me. But now we have a type one augmented system. Mind blown. I know, to the, <laughs> to the holy shit power. Yes. Okay, it's pretty cool, it works. Uh, now, that's our open loop though. We have to close the loop and uh, we're gonna define our control signal, but we're gonna remove that feed forward term, which was, um, what was it, in u times our reference. Because the integral automatically is going to take care of the role of that feed forward. I guess you can do both. You can have an integral and the feed forward, but it, it seems like from what I read and hear that we remove it. Okay. This is our control signal. U, so we have this U K minus one term in here. So this is how we close the loop. It's gonna be equal to a feedback gain matrix. You know what though, I'm gonna call it K augmented because 
so it's going to look a, a little bit like the the control signal that we used before so it's going to have our reference states we still need those and you know what? i'm going to i'm going to put a k on these ones now cuz in general these reference states might be changing and we need a reference state for the integral of the output error. So in, or, in other words, like what do we want the integral of the output error to go to? And the answer is you want it to go to zero. You want the integral of the output error to go to zero eventually at steady state. So we're going to take the difference between this and our states, so like our original states. So how did the integral count as a pole at z equals one? So I, I'm not, to be honest, the connection isn't absolutely clear to me, but the reason I know is we defined a state that was the integral of the error. When we appended that state okay when we added that state we suddenly had an open loop pole at z equals one so that tells us that adding an integrator was equivalent to creating a pole at z equals one i don't have a excellent explanation for that um okay so we're taking the difference between these reference states and where our states actually are and I'll just make a little note here in a different color we never know the true states so we're gonna have these estimated states in practice but for this analysis we're gonna assume that we like know what these actual states are Okay. So let's write this out in a little more compact way. X augmented. So this is going to be our augmented state that includes the integral. This is going to be our A augmented. Should that be minus K aug? No, because... I put a minus sign here in front of the, the states. Like if you got rid of these estimated states, it would be minus K times the states. But because we have the reference, it works out this way. So we're going to have A aug times our augmented states from minus 1 plus a B augmented times u k minus 1 and actually for u k minus 1 here I'm going to put in this expression k aug x reference augmented at k minus 1 So that's, that's this thing. Minus x aug at k minus 1. So that's our u. And then we also need um, this last reference thing. And I don't really have a name for that vector, so I'm just going to rewrite this vector but I'm going to use a zero vector instead of writing the zero, zero. Or K minus one. And then we're going to gather some terms. A aug minus B aug K aug times X aug. Dimensional error vector, brilliant. 
I love it. Should there be a hat over the X Og term? Yes, Tim, but um So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep putting this in a different color. Um because This is the reason, because I want to, and, and we did this before, but we didn't really talk about it when we originally did state feedback control. When I'm designing the controller, I'm assuming that I have access to the true states. In real life, the best you can do is have estimated states, but you design the controller as if you know those states. And that's why I'm able to gather these terms together like because here i'm assuming that these estimated states are true states we know they aren't so this isn't like perfect but if your estimated states were perfect and they were equal to the true states you could do this but this is how we do it thank you for bringing that up because you're you're absolutely right like you don't really ever know Oh wait, I'm missing a term here. Because we still have these reference states left over. And then we still have this, what did you call it, Chris? The dimensional error vector? Brilliant, love it. But what I want to show you here, this A minus BK, this is our closed loop augmented. It's our augmented closed loop system matrix. And the eigenvalues of this, so the eigenvalues of A aug, these are are closed loop poles. So here's the thing. To design or, or to figure out what this augmented feedback gain matrix is, like K aug, how do you think we're going to solve for that? I started to write way too big on this. What's the procedure to solve for the feedback game matrix before? Cayley Hamilton theorem. Exactly. And from Cayley Hamilton follows the um, the Ackerman formula and um, But when you use Cayley Hamilton or use Ackerman, you as the control system designer, remember, you choose what the closed loop poles are. And then you choose K so that this closed loop system matches those poles. And then when you run the controller, the whole system will behave as if it had those poles. So, um, So the choosing of these poles and calculating the feedback gain matrix kind of goes hand in hand. But if you remember when we did root locus, you had some like chosen poles and then you had this extra third pole, which we also called a velociraptor. We called it a rogue pole. And uh, you had to like iterate on your control system design to make sure that third pole um, the rogue pole, you, ha you had to make sure that it bent to your will, but we didn't like directly control what it did. That's why we called it a rogue pole. We kind of just iterated until we found something that worked. Using state feedback, we can choose in advance what we want that third pole to be. So it's kind of like taming, taming the rogue. It's like, um, Jurassic World where Chris Pratt could um you know like mind control the velociraptors make them do what it wanted what he wanted rather so now you're chris pratt 
The raptors are still there, but you can control them through um, an emotional connection and discipline and like raptor treats. Okay, so what we did, let's talk about what we did before. Sit, raptor. Good raptor. Um, well, what before? Let's let's. We said I wanted a settling time of one second. I think an overshoot of ten percent, and our sampling time was zero point zero one two six seconds. And if you do that, we had um, these two poles. Where'd they go? Where'd my poles go? Oh, 0 0.9487 plus or minus 0 0.0652i. The raptor ate our poles. Okay, so this only gives us two poles, but I can choose a third. Let me tell you what I like to do when I choose the third pole. Um, number one, the pole has to be real. Just to verify, was it the eye of Aog or... The A, uh, the IG of AOG minus BOG that provides the closed loop poles. Okay, good question. The closed loop poles are the eigenvalues of this, this whole big guy. Oh, yeah, I see, I see what you, I see. There's a mistake in what I wrote down here then. If you just do the eigenvalues of a og, that that would be the open loop. So we got to do a og minus b og k og. Thank you, thank you. So what I like to do, you know, it has to be real because you only have one pole to choose in this case. You can't choose complex because complex always comes in pairs. So what I like to do is I take the magnitude of this root. Why don't we do that real quick? So Z star was 0 0.948987 plus 0.0652i. 0 0 what I like to do is take the absolute so that's the magnitude of the root that's the distance from the origin and i like to take my third root and put it on the real axis that same distance away or or you can you can move it in a little closer if you want to but um so the magnitude of this was 0 0.9509 Oh man, I was getting focused. I didn't even hear the lawnmower anymore. So, place third root on real axis. Let's let's say positive real axis, and um, the magnitude of this root should be less than 0.9509. And I think it should be, generally, I think it's good if you put it close to 0 0.9509. Like if you put it, if you make it a much faster route, then you start um, increasing the control effort required. So, okay, let's say, so therefore, we're going to choose Z star is... Oh, I missed a zero point there. I'm going to do 0 0.9487 plus 0, 0.0 blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do the conjugate of that. And the third one, I'm going to put it on the real axis, same distance away. So you don't, this root isn't really dominating the other two roots. It's not any slower. It's the same speed.
And then... Because we've earned this through discipline, what I would do is I would say K-Og, I would go into MATLAB, and I would use the acker command. I would put A-Og, B-Og, and then the next argument should be your, um, you know, these poles you chose. I'm going to start putting that together in MATLAB just so we can, um, so I can show it to you. We can verify B -og is B on top of zero, right? Got to attend another class. See you, John. Thanks for hanging out. We're almost done. I'm just going to calculate this K matrix and then we'll peace out. 0 0.9487. Oh, you know what? I'm going to show you a little trick. I wrote code to apply this, which works. I just don't know how. Hey, got to start somewhere, right? 7652i. Okay, and then I'm going to do my z star vector so i'll show you a little trick here you could say z star and then my next one will be the conjugate of z star so that just automatically does the minus for you and then this third one is the magnitude of z star you see what i did i had matlab do the work for me the original z star the conjugate and then just the magnitude oh i did z tar Thank you, Jonathan. And then I'm going to do K Og is going to be the Acker formula of A Og, B Og, and then my Z star vector. And then the icing on the cake is we're going to see if this actually works because we're going to get the eigenvalues of A Og minus B Og times K Og. And when we calculate these eigenvalues, they better be the same as what appears in Z star vec. Or I'm going to punch uh, through my right monitor. Uh, and I'll leave my left monitor intact just so I have one left. All right, let's run this. Z, is it the same? Yes, it worked, ladies and gentlemen. This is our K matrix that the Acker formula gave us. And when we did, it works, it works. Oh my goodness. I don't know what I'm doing anymore, but you know what I mean. It gave us back the same thing. So, I know we blasted through quite a bit here, but this is how you, yeah, I think you guys, <laughs> you guys are right. I, I have typos everywhere. Um, this is how you add an integral, my friends. And think about this now this system that we designed it's going to follow the rules that we set for like settling time and overshoot and it's going to have no steady state error for a step reference so like friday we're going to put all this together we're going to simulate it and you know what we should compare it to the controller we had last time as well and maybe we'll get some answers as to why this is a preferred method. Are the eigenvalues of A og the same as these Z stars with the third being one? Um, I don't think so, Tim, because Z star. 
They're a little different. This is... Remember, the eigenvalues of A aug are our open loop poles. And we just wanted to make sure that, like, the open loop poles will be your original poles from A, and then you're just adding another open loop pole at 1 with the integrator. Oops, I was doing this over here. But yeah, these are the eigenvalues of A aug. They're not the same as like the Z stars. Yeah, this is this is one of the reasons that um, state feedback control is so nice compared to root locus because it's much easier to automate some of the control system design. Yeah, I agree, this is cool. Okay, did we choose those or did they just come out of the open loop poles? Are you talking about the eigenvalues of A augmented? Because we didn't choose, so like if we take our original matrix A, so the eigenvalues of A, this was just our spring mass system. And we, we can't touch this. This system is what it is. All we did is we said, I want to... So these are our, like original open loop poles. I'm augmenting the system so that I add one open loop pole at one. So that's all that I did by adding the integrator. The next step you do feedback control, and that's when... So this minus B aug times K aug, that's adding the effective feedback. And now, our closed loop system behaves according to three poles that we chose. Yeah, Bob Rao, you nailed it. Rick says, can you go over again how we got the integrator? I missed that part of the lecture. Yeah, no problem. We can look at that. So B star comes from the other poles. Are you talking about the estimator? Yet? We, have, we haven't even gotten to the estimator yet. All right, Rick. Um, so this is how we we got the integrator equation so like I, I did it from a graphical approach like this is the output error defined as the difference between the reference and your output the integral is just the area under the curve so I know that the integral so the area up to step k is the integral up to step k minus 1 plus like a little bit extra that closes the gap between k minus 1 and k. And I use the rectangle rule to calculate that little piece of the integral. And then um, I make a definition so that I don't have to keep rewriting this integral, I say that this integral, I'm just gonna call it this new state, like x sub integral or whatever. So I'm taking the same equation using the rectangle rule, but I'm writing it in terms of these states. And this error, I just expanded that term out and that's where the C came from and whatever. Do you guys know that next Friday is the last day of classes? You're welcome, Rick. You're very welcome. It's crazy.
What are we gonna do? I know, it's, uh... It feels weird, because time has all mushed together. The days... The days have mushed together. Will next Friday be the last day of this stream? I don't think so, Virtual Assistant, because... Because... Wait, the music just paused, and I must resume it. Oh, no, it's just another song. Okay. Um, because... I'm going to have... I think I'll have office hours into... Into next week. Well, well after, after next week, I think I'll still do office hours for another week. Maybe another week after that. And then I... I'm starting a summer class, and that still has to be online. If I do it on Twitch, which I think I will, you guys are very welcome to join. Um, I'm glad you enjoy Virtual Assistant. I'm glad you came. Um, what classes am I offering this summer? I'm teaching Dynamic Systems over the summer, which is a junior level system dynamics class at UB. Probably a lot of people in this class, if you're a mechanical engineer, you took it. Um, if you're an undergrad here. If you're a grad student, you probably took something like it. You could take it as a throwback class, Ike. But dynamic systems covers like continuous time dynamics. So it's like Laplace transforms state space, Differential equations, not difference equations. We don't cover control systems. We do like more modeling. But it's all it's all relevant to controls. Maybe we'll do a little controls in the summer, I don't know. But summer's summer's really quick. What's the difference between continuous controls and dynamic systems? Is that your question, Chris? Like, um, continuous controls, it, it'll, continuous controls will kind of be similar to this digital controls class where we focus on how do you define the control input. If you take continuous, there's still stuff you're gonna learn. Like we didn't, we didn't do Nyquist plots. We didn't do, um, we didn't do frequency response stuff. Continuous controls uses that a lot more. What would be the timing of the class? I think it, I think it starts end of May. I need to double check that because I'm teaching it. But I think it starts like the first summer session. So like right after this semester ends, I'll basically start that dynamic systems course. So probably still be Twitch streaming. Is it worth taking for industry purposes? Chris, if you're into controls, I think it's still worth taking. I don't think it'll feel remedial to you. I think you'll still get a lot out of it, especially because you like to think deeply about it and make connections and so, I think you would still enjoy it a lot. Is continuous a bunch more Bodhi plots and stuff? Yes. Um, and, and that stuff is important to know. Like, um, there's uh, phase and gain margin. Like, you've probably heard that before. That's a popular term for controls, but it's related to the Bode plot and the frequency response. And we didn't do anything with that in this course. There's so much control stuff out there. Can I attend and not go for a grade? Which class? Dynamic systems? My summer class, you could definitely hang out and attend. You can audit it, I don't mind. Continuous controls, you can probably audit that as well, not for a grade, but that's not in the, that's a fall course. I bet Dr. Singh would let you. He teaches it. That stuff was practically a foreign language the first time through. Yeah. 
I don't know, dynamics? I feel like you have to do it over and over and over again for it to sink in, because it's so deep. Um, yeah. I'm still blown away by all this stuff. I love thinking about it. Okay, guys. I need to eat some lunch. I have a meeting at 1.30, and then... I'm gonna be back. Um, I'm gonna be back at 3. I'll be here 3 to 5 for office hours. So, Eastern time, two hours from now. You're welcome to come hang out. Um, so, thank you guys for hanging with me. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for all your feedback. Thanks for being part of the digital control systems community. I appreciate you guys. Catch you later, Chris. <laughs>